Today's speaker is Dr. Ulrich Rosenhagen, who is the director of the Center for Religion and Global Citizenry at the UW-Madison. This center is an extracurricular learning community at the UW-Madison and teaches students knowledge of other religions, traditions, while cultivating active engagement with a pl plurality of worldviews, practices, and traditions. The title of Dr. Rosenhagen's speech is Teaching Religion at a pl Public University. We look forward to your presentation and we have made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a way of saying thanks to speaking for us today. As we welcome Dr. Rosenhagen to the podium, I want to remind you if time permits for questions, I'll be out in the audience with the microphone, so please wait till I arrive as our program is being recorded. Welcome, doctor. Yeah, um, thank you for the invitation. Um, Thank you, Rich. I can't see Rich left right there. Um, so, who asked me if I would be willing to talk at the at the Rotary? I've been invited to the Rotary Club twice before: once in Miami, once in Chicago, but I never gave a talk. So this is my Rotary maiden voyage, <laughs> so to speak. You can tell I have an accent. Uh, I always say I'm not faking it. Um, <laughs> So I'm indeed uh, from Germany. I was born, raised in Germany. Um, at some point, met my wife, um, American, uh, in Boston. Not from Boston, but that's where we met, and the rest is history. <laughs> my subject today is the teaching of religion in the university. At UW-Madison, where I teach, I wear two hats. I teach in the Religious Studies program, but I also run the Center for Religion and Global Citizenry. Three of my students and our program coordinator are here with me today. Um, they were already recognized. I want to name their names. Michelle Shah, Noah Rose, um, Michelle Thomas, and Sari Judge. My work at the Center will be the focus of my talk. Um, the Center started in summer of 2017. It followed the Luba Institute for the study of the Abrahamic religions. Well, the Luba Institute brought together mainly Jews, Christians, and Muslims. The center goes beyond the Abrahamic. It reaches out to people of all religious traditions as well as atheists and agnostics. The center pursues academic research, though currently focuses on interreligious undergraduate education. Students can apply for a fellowship. Last year, we awarded 15 students who then formed a co-curricular interreligious learning community for the academic year. In that picture, you see 14 of them. One couldn't make it to the photo shoot. But those three are, um, if you, they're in, in the picture. These interfaith fellows meet weekly for conversation and they organize interreligious events on campus. In early April, for instance, so now I hope, um, yeah, perfect. Um, just showing you a few things we did um, on that slide. Um, in April, early April, for instance, the fellows are planning an interreligious week that kicks off with an interfaith dinner at UW Hillel, followed by a student conference, lectures, workshops, and a movie showing. Last year's program reached 300 students at its events. If you're curious about how Michelle, Noah, and Michelle think about interreligious encounters, you are welcome to read about their experience in their weekly blog posts, which you find on the web. Um, just Center for Religion and Global Citizenry. And those are a few events um, I put up. So, but, but why would a university like UW-Madison invest in an interreligious learning community? Why would an administrator at Bascom think that religion has a place on campus? Shouldn't a major R1 university concern itself with research and science? For long stretches of the 20th century, 
Many prominent intellectuals considered religion to be a human illusion, soon to be obsolete. They hypothesized that all that would be left of religions, their sacred scriptures, robes and yarmulkes, chalices and candlesticks, would become nothing more than exhibition pieces in the Museum of Human Civilization. But, as we now know, those predictions were all too premature. These days, the exact opposite seems to be true. Deep religious commitments that guide people's actions, as well as religious practices that provide meaning, have arisen with new vitality. Religion has again become a matter of great public interest and engagement. To be sure, if religion has ever left campus, it has, as the research about religion on the Quad tells us, returned in the 1990s in more visible but non-traditional, non-denominational forms. Religious expression on today's campus no longer follows old categories. It is pluriform, foggy, and the lines between what is and what is not religion are often blurred and fluid. This new gestalt, however, does not change religion's continuous significance. That's at least what Douglas and Rhonda Husted Jacobsen argue in No Longer Invisible Religion in University Education, a major 2012 study on religion on campus. Other studies make their case in very similar ways. Not only is the college campus a mirror of American society in its diversity, it is also a place to experience religious pluralism and the critical reflection about the sacred. All right. Yeah. To achieve critical reflection, colleges and universities created religious studies departments and programs. UW Madison is no exception here, though the religious studies program at our university is not very large. It was history professor Charles Cohen, who in 1998 introduced a major of religious studies and rebooted a sputtering program. Chuck, my former director at the Luba Institute, is portrayed in this 1998 article in the Wisconsin State Journal. In the article by Bill Weinecke, Chuck reminds the reader of the centrality of religion for any society. If I may add, if you know Chuck, uh, he looks very young in that pic. So. <laughs> About 10 years after Chuck took the helmet of religious studies at UW, a new concept entered the public discourse, religious literacy. Yet, after the attacks of September 11, 2001, things had changed. The study of religion now had an eminent political component. Scholars who used religious literacy as a concept emphasized not so much the critical inquiry of religion anymore. Instead, they sought to stress the public relevance of religion and its study. Knowledge of religion became important to explain international conflicts and the passions that fueled them. It was former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, I put it up, who in her 2006 memoir, The Mighty and the Almighty, Reflections on America, God and World Affairs, famously noted, quote, when I was Secretary of State, I had an entire bureau of economic experts I could turn to, um, and a cadre of experts on non-proliferation and arms control. But I did not have similar expertise available for integrating religious principles into our efforts at diplomacy. At about the same time, Boston University's Stephen Prothero argued the case for religious literacy forcefully in his 2007 book, Religious Literacy, What Every American Needs to Know and Doesn't. 
Prothero started with a paradox. Americans, he claimed, are both deeply religious but also profoundly ignorant about religion. Drawing on the Pew Foundation's religious literacy survey, as well as his own classroom experience, he argued that America is nothing but a nation of religious illiterates. Since religion had always been a major element in American politics and culture, his assessment had far-reaching civic implications. Prothero considered religious literacy, in particular, knowing basic facts about the Bible, Christianity, and world religions, a precondition for full participation in the democratic process. Without the ability to understand religious symbols, beliefs, and practices, it is, according to Prothero, impossible to make sense of many of the nation's political discourses. The book was a bestseller. It hit the right note at the right time. Prothero's appeal for religious literacy had, it, had, had its limits, though. There seemed to be too much emphasis on the role of Christianity for American democracy and too much focus on literacy as a matter of facts and knowledge. There are other scholars who also highlight the civic concern for religion as a resource for democracy. Most prominently, Diana Eck, scholar of Hinduism and founder of Harvard's University, Harvard's, Harvard University's Pluralism Project. However, Eck had a different take on diversity and pluralism. In her A New Religious America, how a Christian country has become the world's most religiously diverse nation, she underscored the new reality of religious pluralism so apparent in 21st century America. Act does not operate upon biblical and Christian illiteracy. Instead, she is all concerned about the religious plural pluralism we as citizens deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Eck calls on American citizens to engage with religious difference and particularity of the other. She pushes us to think how we as citizens, quote, can build creative, I put this up, can build creative multi-religious societies in which our differences can increasingly become the very source of our strength and creativity. And the quote is actually from the other book I put up, Encountering God, an older book that's from the preface to the second edition. Prothero's critics have pointed out that the idea of religious literacy is limited as long as it is built exclusively on cognitive knowledge. Religious literacy as a matter of the mind is a necessary yet insufficient requirement when we engage our differences and particularities. Our most profound convictions often come, al come along with deep emotions. They are part of larger stories and embedded in cultural and ritual practices. So interreligious engagement needs to go deeper. It must appeal to our hearts and hands as much as it appeals to our mental faculties. The person who has realized this wonderfully and has done probably more than anybody else to expand interreligious engagement in contemporary America is the founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps in Chicago, Ibu Patel, a Muslim of Indian descent. Patel grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. In 2007, he wrote a best-selling memoir in which he boldly stated that not race, but faith will be, the will be the dividing issue of the America of the 21st century. His idea of interfaith is centered around service projects during which students build interfaith relationships while they stress the shared value 
of helping others. Under Barack Obama, Patel helped to spearhead the President's Interfaith and Community Service Campus Challenge in 2011, UW Madison participated. As a new paradigm, Patel, uh, Patel introduced in his latest book the concept of appreciative knowledge. Students who engage with other students in interreligious programs should approach each other with appreciative knowledge of the other one's tradition. Appreciative knowledge, Patel states, actively seeks out the beautiful, the admirable, and the life-giving, rather than the deficits, the problems, and the ugliness of other traditions. In my work as director of the Center for Religion and Global Citizenry, I'm indeed fond of this new epistemological paradigm that helps me and my students to recognize the beautiful and good in other traditions. It reminds me of what the late Christa Stendhal, New Testament scholar at Harvard and Bishop of Stockholm, once described as holy envy. Holy envy are those moments, Stendhal said, when we recognize something in another religious tradition that is beautiful but is not in ours. Though we should not grab it or claim it, we should instead rejoice in the beauty of others. The students of the 21st century, my students, more than their parents and their grandparents, have come to grasp with their own particularity and to engage with their religious others, moral commitments and spiritual practices. Together, they slowly craft a new world of interfaith encounters, of interreligious engagement, dialogue and learning. They are living in the age of interfaith. We can only hope that their universities prepare them well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tom Deschant. Um, you mentioned uh, sort of a non-sectarian new gestalt among some of the students. Uh, can you give me a sense of how that is expressing itself? What forms of uh, sort of religious expression that if they're not following a specific sect today or a particular religion, how do they express themselves? Um, so for example, I had a slide up earlier to, uh, about an event we're going to to run together with Hillel and Press House and other places, movement for our movement. Um, so um, where, where students uh, uh, to come together for a dance performance. Um, it's in, in the Chasen and um, there is an interfaith component they explore this, so all of a sudden, they, they have a, a physical, a bodily experience, but that's no longer happening at, at, at a traditional place like Press House or, or the Lutheran Campus Ministry. That was, so that would be one example. Um, service work, that's always, that is no longer Lutheran service or, or Catholic service. It's, um, something they do together, come up with their own projects and, and their own, so, so they, students then discuss religious identity, but it coming in, that's not, there is no um, marker you have to have. So th those are a few things that come to mind right away. Have you ever heard of a former Rotarian, Rabbi Manfred Swarzynski? Who um, started it, doing it, what you're doing 50 it, years ago? Indeed, and I heard that he had a German accent, so we're very close. <laughs> you sounded just like he did when he got off the boat. Oh. My mother met him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, in my defense, I flew. <laughs> How do you deal with, I mean, our country was founded on freedom of religion and freedom from religion. But you have 
a group of, call them gaslighters or con people who have hijacked certain religions. That everything they supposedly believe in runs counter to reality. And just for the record, I'm a recovering Catholic. <laughs> Well, the beauty of this country, and that's why it's such a, the, what Diana Eck calls the most religiously diverse country in the world, is the First Amendment. And the, I mean, the, um, the, when you compare Europe uh, to North America, um, where, whereas in Europe you have uh, the secularization paradigm lasting and much stronger than you have it here, um, it's because traditionally um, religion was tied to the state. Whereas here it was very clear, religion is important, yeah, but it's not a governmental thing. It's not, no one decrees a creed. Yeah, you, and, you, and that, um, and I think, is the beauty of this country. That also means that no one can tell uh, how people use their own religious sources and traditions. And that's a fight within traditions um, and uh, I mean, I have obviously opinions, but I dare not to voice them. <laughs> and, but I, I, I think that's a struggle in each tradition. Yeah, I, mean, I came here um, as, a, as, a, as a Lutheran from Germany, um, and I'm in Wisconsin, and you're not only having uh, the ELCA, you're not having uh, just the Missouri Senate, you also have a Wisconsin Senate. Yeah, and they still speak German apparently, or, or read those texts from, from the 1600s. Um, so it's an issue I think religions, um, religious traditions need to deal with um, on their own. I know from, from the data um, that, um, so among the younger generation, um, so students in, in that generation are very upset about the way the turns religion has taken in this country. And it's mostly that students say they feel like they are hijacked by extremely, um, by extremists, by extremely conservatives, and the minority of students uh, find themselves agreeing with that. That's why now you have different numbers, the so-called nuns, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, so that is N-O-N-E, not N-U-N. <laughs> so nuns, um, those who don't belong to any, um, don't have a religious affiliation in a traditional sense, they're not religiously organized. It's not that they're not religious, but they're not religiously organized. Um, and they, they, they are those, when I said fluid, um, and th th it's not clear, is it religion, is it not religion? There are different numbers. Um, I know of a Pew study th that talks about 24% uh, in, in that generation. Um, I know another study that talks about 36%. So, just, so there is also a big change on, on, on the religious landscape. Um, and that has to do with people who are upset and disappointed and now look for, for new ways and they might not end up as a recovering Catholic. <laughs> we have one last question. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, once Gandhi uh, said to Indian people after the war with Pakistan that in order to redeem yourself, go and raise a Muslim orphan as a Muslim, not as Hindu, and serve them. Now, do you think we get to a point that our students go and serve other churches, synagogues, that they are not from their own faith, in order to learn from it, and in order to participate and be more active, rather than go to their own mosque, or, or, or church or synagogues. So I, I can't, um, um, so I, I, I can give you two answers. Or I, it's, it, I need to be a little balanced. So I'm hopeful when I look at my students, uh, what they do, how they engage in, in, in those differences and particularities, the, the sympathy, the, co the compassion, the appreciative knowledge they, they develop 
over time for other traditions. But what you are asking, that is a lot. I don't know if that will, um, it would be great, but when I um, look in, in, in the paper, read the news about India and Pakistan over the last days, um, it is, it, it, I mean, the world needs people who, who live by Gandhi's words, but um, I hope that at least in small steps, we um, at the university can train interfaith leaders who then can go out and serve others um, who are not necessarily um, part of their own tradition and background. So I hope that kind of answers this a little bit. So I'm hopeful, but I also see that the realities are tough. Um, I don't want to just um, brush, uh, brush over that. You indeed an inquisitive bunch, I must say that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rosenhagen, for your presentation. Um, if you're interested in serving on our Interact Committee, on the tables are half-sheet flyers that talk a little bit more about it, and you can either fill those out or contact our Rotary office. Also, um, if uh, any Rotaract students and advisors and committee chairs who are still, still here, please come forward and want to take a picture. We are adjourned. Thank you.